My name is Irene Kurka and I welcome you to my podcast, Neue Musik Leben. I have studied classical singing, but I'm singing a lot of contemporary music. And if you would like to meet me or hear me sing, please look at my website www.irenekurka.de. I also put my website in the show notes. This is a German podcast, but once in a while I do some interviews in English. This podcast is all around new and contemporary and experimental music. I share with you the backgrounds behind the scenes and I want to bring the humans out of the new, new music world closer to you. I'm always very thankful for your feedbacks and I love getting your emails or through Facebook or however you contact me. I'm also proud that I'm cooperating with the NMZ Neumusikzeitung, which is a big German music paper. Today I have a great interview for you with the composer Tom Johnson. Hello, I'm sitting here in Cologne with the wonderful composer Tom Johnson and I'm so privileged and happy to see you here. Well, I'm very glad to be here and I'm feeling very good because the concert last night was so fine and there were so many old friends. I haven't been in Cologne for quite a few years, but I've been uh, over the years in Cologne uh, several times. I did some uh, um, Hörspiele for Klaus Schöning, WDR, and um, then... Uh, um, Gisela Gronemeyer and uh, 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 Schlegel uh, organized the oratorio for Deutschland Radio, uh, Bonner for oratorio, and uh, many other. I was, I guess, for the Hochschule for Musik once or twice, and uh, different things. In, in I know Cologne. you have a very close connection to Cologne. Yeah, and so a lot of people like Peter Berenson, who I had worked with on at the radio. I hadn't seen for 20 years, and he showed up at the concert. Yes, it was a wonderful yeah. concert. I was yeah. there too. So let's get into my questions. Yes. I would like to know, how did you find your way into new and exper experimental music? Oof. Well, you have to read the, the new music text, the book. <laughs> okay, we'll talk I, about that too. Yeah, <laughs> I, I got up to page 62 today which is uh, the interview I did with the Yale Oral Archives in the late 90s. And that covers um, all the early years. Um, and it's many different phases and things that uh, I'm supposed to uh, repeat uh, to, to really answer your question. But uh, that's already 62 pages and uh, okay. we don't have time, I so think. Do you No, People should like, read the book if they I know, want to they know will all that. I know they read the book, but like your first approach or anything that was very well, early uh, and unique? I often say that my logical music begins with counting music. And, uh, of course, and when in different languages. Oh, yeah, I didn't, uh, I didn't do it last night. I was thinking if they asked me that I was going to give the example... Eins, 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 zwei, eins, drei, eins, vier, eins, fünf, eins, sechs, eins, sieben. Eins, zwei, eins, eins, zwei, zwei, eins, zwei, drei, eins, zwei, vier, eins, zwei, fünf, eins, zwei, sechs, eins, zwei, sieben. Eins, zwei, drei, eins, eins, zwei, drei, zwei, eins, zwei, drei, drei, eins, zwei, drei, vier, eins, zwei, drei, vier, eins, zwei, drei, sechs, eins, zwei, drei, sieben. Eins, zwei, drei, vier, eins, eins, zwei, drei, vier, zwei, eins, zwei, drei, vier, drei, eins, zwei, drei, vier, vier, eins, zwei, drei, vier, fünf, eins, zwei, drei, vier, sechs, eins, zwei, drei, vier, fünf, äh, sieben. <laughs> I, I made a mistake. Oh, so a performance by <laughs> No, but I, you know, if I'm concentrating in, I, I can do these in performance right. uh, with the, often in um, um, sound poetry festivals or performance festivals and sometimes in concerts. And, um, That was the beginning. I, I, I uh, gradually learned how to count to seven uh, in a musical way in uh, 12 different languages. 
and this became um, a, a 30 minute recital well, that I could do. And when did you start that? Well, that starts in the 19, in the late 70s. Uh, I don't know exactly. Um, I like to tell this story about one day when I was on the uh, Coney Island on the beach. It was a hot summer day and I was all alone. And uh, I started uh, counting. I'd been thinking, I'd written, met Charlie Morrow, who was also doing counting, wanting to make music out of counting. And um, so I started it, but I decided to, instead of counting in English, I would count in French. And, uh, well, I won't do it now. <laughs> Because I've recorded this quite a few times. Yes. And then I thought, I, what other languages do I know? Well, I'd been to Russia at, with the Eel Russian course, so I could count to seven in Russian. And, um, and I knew some German already. I had had one course in German and Spanish. And then I thought, well, but each so language this, has this another rhythm. Music? It's another sound. It's yeah. so, so beautiful. Yeah. I think I can make music out of these languages. Then I wanted to start learning. Uh, other, every time I had met somebody who uh, I came from another language I didn't know, I wanted to learn languages from native speakers, and I always did, to try to get the pronunciation right. And um, so I finally had these, uh, had 12 languages that I had pieces that I liked, and this was sort of the beginning, I think. But then, so you uh, were first interested in counting, and then well, you added the sound. That was one category, anyway. But about the same time, it's 1979, when I started. When I 78, really, when I was uh, had gotten these nine bells hanging on the ceiling, and this is a geometry, geometric formation, three by three, and I started walking around the, this three by three square and hitting the bells as I came to them, and then hanging the bells in a different order and, and making the pathway in a different uh, formation, and then doing a figure eight, and then doing uh, a circle all around, or the ins inside circle, or, the, or just something with the middle bell and the, and the side bells, or whatever. Um, so that was uh, geometric logic. And then about the same time I was writing uh, symmetries, which was geometric logic with notes on paper written within a, um, a musical typewriter where you didn't have the, uh, the staves, you just had notes. So you could make the notes in any diagonal formation as long and as high and as low as you wanted and all this. So that became symmetries. And so there were um, several different kinds of, of logical uh, formations that were, were starting also, around this time. Were you also good in mathematics? No. no. Well, I mean, I guess I wasn't <laughs> so bad, but but they told me uh, when I was a teenager, oh, but you're a musician, you don't need to study mathematics. That's just for the engineers. Wow. And uh, very bad advice. That's a bad advice. Yeah. I, I made the discovery that there are musicians who are really bad at math and there are musicians who are really amazing at math I because suppose, yeah, yeah. music is somewhat math you, yeah, know, I yeah. mean, you know that better than me but it's yeah not necessarily a lot of musicians are bad at math and I, I can't say I'm good at math uh, and uh, uh, but I just didn't get any didn't do it when I was young enough to to really make, learn mathematics at the, the age of 40 or so I said to gee it's too bad that I didn't uh, uh, study math. So I took a uh, course finally in differential calculus. And uh, I was um, in this course in a very low level night course in a university in upstate New York. And uh, I studied and I studied. I finally passed the exam. But all these 19, 20 year old students who were in the course didn't study at all and they were getting A's with no problem. It's just the youth of the of the mind that mm -hmm. absorbs these things much more quickly. Uh, so I decided, well, <laughs> after that experience, if I can't even do a differential calculus, it's going to be very late to, to yeah, start. but that's uh, very difficult. Uh, algebraic uh, geometry and everything else. What represents good new music for you? Well, I think the important thing is that the composer has found his own music, some kind of, not necessarily original in some dramatic sense, but just something that's, that's honest. It didn't 
It wasn't the music of somebody else. And it's not being a copy of something and, and not the, certainly not the copy of the teacher or um, somebody has um, gotten into, into their own music. Uh, that's what's important for me anyway. And what are the qualities you most appreciate in performers you work with? In, in the performers? Yes. Well, uh, basically, and this may seem uh, obvious, but it's not so obvious and, and it's rather rare. Um, get the notes right. Really a perfection of, of the, uh, not change the tempo, get in time and in tune. That's a way to simplify. Okay. A good musician is somebody who plays in time, in tune. And um, yeah, that's, uh, but they the, the get the right notes and the right tempo is very important for, for my music uh, and any sort of objective mathematical music. You, it has to be right. And, um, and you can identify a wrong note immediately. Of course, when music is, becomes very subjective and it's all expressionistic and so complex, there's so many levels of, of logic and illogic at the same time, uh, you can't tell whether these notes are right or wrong. And then it doesn't, this um, precision isn't so important. But uh, with my music, uh, you got to get it right. And how do your friends, family, colleagues, and audience react to your sort of music? Oh. And how do you deal with their reactions? Well, most of my friends are, are, these days are, are colleagues and people who know me and who, who like my music or we wouldn't be friends. Uh, um, of course, my family uh, is, uh, comes from other places and they don't understand very much. And we don't even talk about music. Uh, the neighbors and the family uh, that's just people I know from and the, the people I know in the American church in Paris <laughs> I have a very good friends in, in there but we talk about uh, life and death and, and uh, God we don't talk about music I also like that you have a certain humor in your music and yeah. last night you, you, you even told the audience that you were sometimes looking around how they react or yeah. if they were laughing or enjoying it. Well, I, I talked too much about that uh, and uh, because I wanted people to feel uh, at ease if they needed to smile to smile. It worked. But, but, they but, were more at ease. Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah. <laughs> and then at the end, uh, they, were, they were more at ease. But I, I should have said, as I, as I just read this morning in the, in the book, something I said many years ago, I, uh, I like humor. But I made a rule a long time ago, never try to be funny. That's good. Because every time you try to be funny, it's, it's, you're telling jokes and it's very it's, uh, stupid. And the, the example I give in the book, which is a very good example, is, uh, is uh, the aria in the Four Note Opera where, where the baritone says, in a moment you will hear the woodblock. It's a tiny event, but I hope you do not miss it. Because... It's, it's a nice sound and it's, it's a be, I hope you do not miss it. Listen carefully because in a moment you will hear, I hope you do not miss it. I hope you do not miss it. I hope you do not miss it. I hope you did not miss it. I hope you did not miss it. You laughed. Why does everybody laugh when finally the woodblock came? But this is, this is just telling a situation, an absurd situation. It's not trying to be funny. It's just telling a little story. I know. It's. It's. I mean, you <laughs> said it yourself. It's. It's an art than to be actually. Funny yeah, yeah. But that's the kind of humor that I try to do. You're very good. I, at I mean, that I try not to do. <laughs> and uh, I like because it. I can't. You, I said you can't try to be funny. Yes, yes. But, but I like it so much because I think, especially in the contemporary music, we are so serious, and yeah, yeah. and I always like yeah, it if there's yeah. some something else. But but it's uh, it's not the. Humor that's humorous, it's uh, the logic that's humorous. Mm -hmm. And then the good example of that in the concert last night is the place where, where the clarinet plays the descending s scales longer mm -hmm. and longer and longer. And the other two instruments play only the first note. And then he get, finally gets down to the bottom of the scale. And then the other two instruments only play the last note. <laughs> and then he goes, 
until finally he's only playing the last note with them. And then he starts going back up, and they're still playing the bottom note, and he goes up. And then they go back to playing the, the top note again. Uh, that's a, an absurd way to play a melody. Why, is, why should the highest note and the lowest note be so much imp more important than all the other notes? Well, but why not? They are important, right? That's yes. where things begin and end. So there's a logic about that. <laughs> certainly, certainly. But, but it becomes funny when you, when you actually hear people doing this in an exaggerated way. Yes. Do you think there are prejudices against new music? And are there things you would like to um, see change? Or is there anything you even can add to it yourself? Well, uh, the biggest, uh, uh, one of the biggest prejudices is, uh, I find is for mathematicians who do calculations and understand um, logical sequences very well. But whenever I question them about my music, they say, I listen to music to not think. I think all day, about, and I'm counting all day. I'm not going to count when I listen to your music. For me, this is an anti-intellectual um, point of view uh, for, uh, from a highly intellectual person, which is a little difficult to, in the, to understand. But I think a lot of people are anti-intellectual when they, when they listen to music. Um, they don't even want to count, let alone... Uh, Think about, uh, is, is the key going to change? Is this the same note to the, the, uh, the, where the phrase started uh, um, two seconds ago? Or is it, has it moved? Is the music moving? Is it staying the same? Those are not very complicated questions. Uh, and it's not, you don't have to be a mathematician to, to notice that da is not the same as da. Uh, but if you're anti-intellectual and you refuse to think about music, da and da will pass as the same thing. You didn't notice any difference because you're not uh, trying to listen. So I think uh, anti-intellectual listeners are losing a lot. And I can't tell people how to listen. And if you want to just listen in order not to think, as so many uh, mathematicians do, uh, well, that's, that's your problem. You get, get your satisfaction from something else, not from music. Certainly. You're also very, very modern in a way. You have a YouTube channel. <laughs> so we are kind of colleagues. Everybody has a YouTube channel no. today, especially and you have a, even a I website. I have one, but um, I think you've, I mean, in the music, yeah. there's not too much. Uh, maybe it. not, yeah. And I mean, I'm still also the like a pioneer in this area, and and I yeah. think you're also um, very very much ahead. You know, one reason that people don't have their own sites is because they they go to SoundCloud. Mm -hmm. Do you know SoundCloud? Yes, certainly. And uh, it's easy to put your things up there, and then you don't have to to produce things yourself. Really, you just uh, send in the, the uh, that's only for sound files, and you don't have to do a visual file or anything. Or you can you can th do things on YouTube as as I'm doing. Right, you have a real video. I can see you. You explain yeah, yeah. things. But it's a, it's a YouTube channel. Right, it's not it's not YouTube my own channel, and, um, and it's not my own site. And you also um, have the music played in there. It's called Illustrated Rhythm. How did you get Illustrated to do that? Music? Uh, illustrated Music. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, there's there's 20 different videos now. All which you can find if you go to YouTube and ask for Tom Johnson Illustrated Music. Yeah, I'm very pleased with those. Uh, I've been doing them rather quickly. These 20 came in, in a matter of six months or so. And uh, with good video people who... who no, I think they're that. very, very good. Yeah, and yeah. we also will put it in the show notes that hopefully my listeners will yeah, yeah, go I, and check it out. <laughs> I, uh, I hope... Um, Yeah, I've worked with the good uh, video people. I have to pay because I, I wanted this to be very professionally done and, and, and not to be thinking about uh, exposures and, and cutting myself. Somebody else has to do that. Uh, but I've found good people in Paris who uh, I can work with and who've done good. But I think it's, I've been going too fast. And uh, at first there were so many things I wanted to explain and do video about that um, I had a lot of ideas But now I'm starting to think, well, uh, it's better. To, I've been going too fast. I need, want to wait for till we're getting uh, more visits and, 
and not just in the hundreds, but maybe in the thousands, like uh, so many video uh, YouTube sites, and uh, learn how to do it a little better, get some more reactions. And, and also, uh, now it's getting harder because the things that were obvious, uh, how I wanted to, to do the, show the drawing and explain the piece, I've already done. So now it's some more things that are harder to explain. I haven't even touched opera, for example. I don't, I don't think I will. Maybe it's operas are already visual. They explain themselves or they should. And I don't think I'm going to do video about any of those pieces. But um, I don't know. I need to think. I need more time to. And now work more slowly. I'm sure you will find more topics. And it's, yeah. it sounds really great. And yeah, last night you also presented your new book, Finding Music. What can we expect there if you well, find this book? The, the title, was, by the way, comes from a, an article that I wrote uh, for um, Positionen, German magazine in the late 90s, uh, where I said, uh, I want to find the music, not to compose it. Will die Musik finden, nicht sie komponieren. And um, that was a, a new idea for me. It means uh, objective music, something that came from uh, from numbers that I found. One, two, three is not something I invented. And, uh, or the Pascal's triangle is not something I invented. Um, Pascal didn't invent it either. I don't think he found that. This is a found thing, like pi and lots of other, most mathematics is really found. Um, automata uh, can be so easily deduced, usually. They're not really invented either. Um, so, but it's not just mathematics. Uh, one of my favorite pieces came from physics. Uh, it's the law of the pendulum, Galileo. It's it's. Uh, uh, we just did another video about Galileo. That's cool. a that's a nice one. Coming up. Uh, yeah, and it's number 20. and uh, Pierre Berthe is the performer now. Galileo is uh, not only the title of a piece, it's the name of an instrument, which is uh, four and a half meters tall. And from this um, bar, it uh, five pendulums swing. The longest one is two and a half meters, and the shortest one is about um, uh, less than one meter, I think. And um, the uh, short one uh, swings... Uh, according to the law of the pendulum, exactly twice as fast as the longest pendulum. And the pendulums in between are uh, two-thirds, three-quarters, and four-fifths of the tempo. So um, you, uh, you get these five tempos, uh, and you can't compose anything. You have to just follow, hit the pendulums when they come back. And if you hit them a little too early, you throw out the synchronization and you've blown the whole thing. But if you want them to be in synchronization and respect the pendulums and the law of the pendulums, you just have to keep those proportions exactly the way the pendulum swings. Okay. And so this is finding music in the pendulum or in five pendulums. That, by the way, I should... Uh, Uh, we're not here to talk about other composers, but I must mention Alvin Lussier, because all of his music comes out of usually acoustical phenomena. I don't think he ever followed the pendulum law, but a lot of acoustical laws he has followed, and uh, standing waves and different things like that. Uh, and the way s strings vibrate, uh, his music is all coming out of physics. And that's another kind of found music. Um, but mine is more found in the, in the numbers rather than in physical formula. But Galileo is an exception. So about this we will read in the book. Yeah. Of finding music. Yeah. And you did it together with uh, Gisela Gronemeyer and Raul Mörchen. It's published at Musiktexte, but I will also put that in the show notes. I also, I mean, last night you also um, did a piece and I heard some of those pieces before and I always love them, where you also speak, you were also speaking, and mm -hmm. also two of the um, musicians yeah, so on I, stage, and um, 
yeah how how did you get to that i mean it's i mean it's what you said it's the describing part but that you're also yeah. so um you also feel comfortable on stage doing that yourself well, and it's um, I don't know. Well, I it's like very to talk. charming i like, like to, to talk, talk. No, also because uh, I earned my living as a music critic mm -hmm. for 11 years with the Village Voice. So after all those years of um, being a music critic, I was used to talking about music. And I felt pretty good. At Yale, you know, they, they give you a lot of English courses. and You, you end up uh, controlling the language pretty well, uh, even if you're a music major. And uh, I liked uh, talking. And then I, because I was, I didn't like uh, anti-intellectual listeners. I wanted to have people, I wanted people to understand my music. And I explain and write the introductions and hope that people use, give introductions and program notes when they do concerts. Uh, but then I started um, wanting to write operas because in the late 60s, I was going a lot to theater and I was uh, hearing uh, I wasn't a big opera fan, but I'd, I'd heard most of the uh, standard repertoire also, but I didn't really like that too much. But as I started in the um, late 60s with the experimental theater scene, um, and I was uh, hearing, seeing Beckett for the first time, and the, a lot of people were doing Gertrude Stein, the plays and operas of Gertrude Stein, which had seldom been performed, but all the th music, the, no, the theater directors in uh, New York wanted to do their versions of Bruce's sign, because of course you can do whatever you want with these, with these texts. But, uh, so I was starting to, uh, and a lot of people were writing new texts, and Sam Shepard was a new voice in theater at that time. And there was um, Richard Schechner was starting the performance garage where there were uh, new, uh, new theater ideas. And La Mama was just starting. And La Mama had lots of new pieces. So all of this uh, energy interested me a lot. And I could see a lot of uh, new principles happening in theater that uh, I had uh, never seen before. So I started thinking, yeah, no, but, but nobody's doing opera. I should do an opera. So, but I want to write my own uh, text because I don't want to try to set Gertrude Stein. That didn't make sense. Anyway, uh, Virgil Thompson had already done that as, as well as I could because uh, he was from the period and he knew Gertrude Stein. Um, so I had to do it in a different way. And so that was when I started writing sketches, which led to the four-note opera, which was my first opera. And um, uh, so that was why well, I quoted a little while ago one of the arias from there. And that was a kind of humor and a kind of Tom Johnson opera, which was, uh, got me started. Wonderful. I also would like to know, do you have a certain time management or rituals during the day or could you advise something? Well, to I decided very young that... Uh, I wouldn't take uh, jobs accompanying modern dance classes, which was my main source of income in the uh, late uh, 60s, early 70s, um, before, uh, before noon, preferably before two in the afternoon, because my best concentration time was in the morning. And I thought, well, I'm going to just devote my mornings to composing, even if I don't have any ideas. <laughs> at least I'll uh, work with my tape recorder or improvise at the piano or try to sketch something and think about my own music. And uh, that was a discipline which was important and which I still follow today pretty much, although I'm a little less, I'm a little more flexible about that today. Sometimes I, I don't feel the need to write a new piece every day. <laughs> Certainly. I can feel you. I'm also like... Morning time is like my best concentration time. Yeah, I think there are many people, but I know people who only only uh, work at, well at two in the morning. So, I know, I know. Yeah. Everybody is different. What are you thankful for today? Gee, that sounds like a religious question. And um, as a believer, I have to be thankful for my existence and the love of God and all of these things. Um, but uh, on a more personal um, on all level, I'm really thankful that so many people 
appreciate my music today. It's uh, that concert last night was so symbolic of uh, people that had disappeared from my life. I thought they disappeared, and then they're suddenly they're there. They still like my music, and they still want to come back to Cologne and, and see Tom Johnson hear the the new piece, and that's very satisfying. And um, I'll never be as famous as some of the, my contemporary composers, but uh, I've done a lot better than most of the others, and uh, so I I can't complain. And um, uh, one thing I'm also very grateful. And this is uh, unusual in in music. I was have been able to earn my living as a composer since the age of about 45. After the New York years, and I came to Europe, and uh, Nine Bells was starting to circulate, and I started to know people in the in the German radio and the French radio, and I was doing Hirschfeld's and stuff. I found that I had more work in Europe than in in the United States. And uh, since I was uh, uh, had no children and no car, I didn't need a lot of money to live. And um, I was able to just depend, give up criticism and accompanying modern dance and things like that and just live with my own music. And uh, that's, um, that was very important uh, at the, to a relatively young age to be able to... Um, uh, I never teach. I never taught. Uh, it wasn't exactly on purpose, but I only once or twice had reasonable offers for college jobs. But these always came at moments when um, I didn't want to be tied down because I had a tour in Europe that I was going to do or I had a, some invitations to California or something, and I I didn't want to be tied down to being at the... At the uh, theory course every Monday morning. And so I always said no. And uh, uh, I suppose if I'd had a, um, been an offer for a really big job in a big university, I probably would have, like Morton Feldman, I would have decided to, to <laughs> grab the money while it was there. But I never did. And it's, it's better because uh, I've never depended on teaching and other things too. And even if I didn't make very much money in those early years, or even now, uh, as a composer, but it's enough to live on, and I still don't have a children or a car, and mm. <laughs> and my wife uh, earns her her own living, and mm. uh, it's, it's, I don't need more money than that. Yeah, it sounds wonderful, and yeah, last night was really very very lovely. Who or what has played the greatest role in shaping you, and what inspires you? Oh well, my my two mentors, mm. I always say, were uh, Morton Feldman and John Cage. And um, those are the, those are my idols. Those are the, Feldman taught me so many things. He was really my teacher. And uh, the only teacher I think I ever had were for composition where I believed everything he said. I took everything very seriously, very literally what he said. Elliot Carter, Judy uh, Weiner, other people, they had to, interesting ideas and it was always a little bit maybe they're right and maybe I ought to try that but Feldman uh, he'd been through it and he was he was doing what I wanted to do and if he said I have to do that I would do it and uh, when I was studying with him I really didn't think he was uh, an important composer like like uh, Cage and Elliot Carter and Stravinsky and Schoenberg but uh, As I tell in the end of that interview, some years later, after a transforming experience of hearing Coptic Light, uh, this is 10 years after I'd studied with him, and at the flute, flute and orchestra, and then the long pieces. And I said, wow, Feldman, he was better than any of those others. Mm. What a chance I had to know this man. Certainly. Oh, that was great. The, to real, of course, when I was studying with him, it was 67 to 69. He hadn't written his best music yet. He was getting there. He'd written a lot of good music, but uh, he hadn't written Coptic Light. He hadn't written Flute and Orchestra. He hadn't written for Philip Guston. 
so that's wonderful to realize that finally he was better than all the others for me. But Cage was more important in, as, a, as a human model because Cage, he knew what he wanted very young. And he, he, he had to, his master, too. He, he never minces words about the importance of Schoenberg in his life. And uh, the, how he, f f the discipline of his music is the same as the discipline of Schoenberg. But then uh, how he had the courage to try the things that nobody else wanted to try. P prepare piano, what a crazy idea. And, uh, and uh, theater music and... And making the music with silence, with noises, and uh, all of these things. Uh, what bravery. And you have to believe in what you're doing. And that was my model. Boy, if I could be like Cage, how can I be that strong, that sure of myself, and that ready to go against all the, the fashions of the day? Um, so that was, I always tried to, to, to lead my life like Cage. Cage was also a very ethical man and a very, very clear-headed. And when I have a question uh, like, uh, should I accept this commission? Uh, or do I want to consider working with this publisher? Uh, do I want to accept this invitation to Oslo? Uh, when I'm not sure, I always think, what would Cage have done? <laughs> Because Cage, I remember one time when he, he refused the invitation to uh, to Iran because there was a political problem, and other times when he uh, he refused to to go with certain publishers and certain ideas, and uh, but he knew he knew what he had to do and what was going to be the best choice, and he didn't always take the money. You know, some a lot of composers just take the biggest fee and don't think too much about the principles. But he was very clear about principles, and uh, I want to be like him. Mm. That actually leads me up to my next question. What does it mean for you to be true to yourself or authentic in the music business, and how do you keep true to yourself? By trying to do what John Cage would have done. <laughs> That's really what we were talking about. Yes, yeah. we were just talking yeah, about Yeah, he's, he's my model as a, as a human model. But uh, how, to, how to listen to music, how to write my music, How do we get the right sound? That's, I have to follow Morton Feldman because he's the one who understood that. Uh, wow, what a great composer. What does success mean for you? Oh, just be, to be myself and what I, what I am. I feel my today that I'm a, uh, as successful as I ever wanted to be. I never wanted a lot of money. I never wanted a lot of... Um, fame. I never wanted to be the president of anything, uh, or uh, have a uh, be the um, president of some conservatory or director of this or that ensemble. I'm 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 successful. I'm I'm very happy with what I'm. That reminds me, and when I was young, uh, the opera, the Fournot opera, was going very well. I uh, actually. I was had to control of a group that was uh, doing this opera, and I tried to get some bookings for this opera. I thought, oh, I'll direct this opera, and and if we get a lot, we can book tours, and then uh, the next year I can write another opera, and we have I have my own opera company, and I'll I'll be like uh, um, Peter Maxwell Davies and have have a organize a festival in my opera my opera company, but. Um, That's a tough business, <laughs> and, and I did, we didn't get very many bookings. But I decided I didn't really want that anyway. I didn't want to have to just be obligated to write another opera every year in order to get another grant, in order to pay all these singers, in order to keep going. I wanted to, my loft to be a little more flexible. So I didn't want um, that kind of money and, and fame either. And uh, so I think I've, yeah, some, somebody said to, Uh, it's a very well known. Uh, be careful to to know what you want in life, because that's probably what you're going to get. Mm -hmm. And I think I knew what I wanted in life, and that's more or less what I'm getting. That's amazing. What drives you forward? Do you have a vision? 
Yeah, I want to, my only concern now is to is to clean up the files. <laughs> I'm 80 years old, and that's you know average life expectancy is about that. So I don't have that many more years. And I've decided to donate all of my files to the French National Library, and I've been. But I don't want them to um, file everything. I'm trying to get it all into boxes, the way I want, uh, so that things are classed uh, in in the way they should be, and not just leave these things to um, functionaries who who probably don't know the music and won't get it right anyway. And so I'm trying to put together the sketches that go with the particular pieces that they belong with and uh, the pieces that are related to one another go with the sketches related to tile work or with uh, self-similar melodies or with uh, self-replicating melodies and try to classify these things. And then now that I've got their files pretty well organized, the things that are on paper, and more or less all of the mediocre pieces and the student pieces have been uh, completely destroyed. Really? Yeah. Oy. The ones, you know, I, I say in uh, somewhere that uh, you shouldn't leave all of this evaluation to the musicologists. The composers and writers should take a little responsibility themselves for throwing the, throwing out the, the, the real um, bad pieces. But now, um, there's still there's a lot of things unexplained, so that's one reason why I started the illustrated music uh, videos. So I want to try to do videos and drawings. A lot of times, in the 80s and 90s, I wasn't doing drawings uh, at all. And a lot of times, a drawing that shows the form of a piece in a symbolic, uh, numerical way is adds a lot to, to the understanding of the piece. And it's nice to... Sometimes I do that with the illustrated music video and um, ex explains things a lot better. So that in, in this way, um, when people come to the, uh, the file of Galileo and they can see the video and they, the sketches for this and the early visions, photos of the early visions and uh, of how the instrument was before I had a good instrument and so forth, it's, uh, the piece is, is really finished. It, it, with the with the complete file, and just the score was was not uh, really the finished piece. Well, we already are at the last question, and my last question is: Which tip would you like to give young artists? Be yourself. Let the music do what it wants to do. That's where this. I should have thought of that first, uh, but that means be yourself also. Uh, but no, it means it's a little different. But that's what Feldman always told me. And that's what he always did. Let the music do what it wants to do. And he would spend hours at the piano listening to three chords and uh, trying to figure out if there was another chord that went with them or not. And if the F sharp should be in the high octave or the low octave. And if maybe he should add a G. You know? He wasn't sure. He listened to it again. Let me run it again. And the, the, I tell the story about the, the, the six, seven chords that I wrote for him and how he played it over and over at the piano because he knew that I hadn't mm -hmm. really listened. But he wanted to listen and show me how to listen. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this is it. And, but his main question as he listened is, what is this music wanting to do? Let it do what it wants to do. Forget what I want it to do. Forget all of my own ambitions for this piece, my own, and what the performers are going to want and what the audience is going to want. What does the music want? And I think that's a very good question for any composer who wants to be himself or herself and just um, do something honest, something different from everybody else. Yeah. End of sermon. Yeah. Well, Tom, thank you so much for taking your time and being here with me. And I wish you all the luck with whatever you will still do. And Great. enjoy your time in Cologne. Yeah. I hope that this interview was inspiring for you. And if you want, you can write me your ideas or suggestions through Facebook or through email. I'm looking forward to hear from you. Thank you 
that you listened to my podcast today. And I really hope that you liked it and that it inspired you. I would be very happy if you could suggest this podcast to your friends and colleagues. Thank you very much. I wish you all the best. Live your music, live your life and see you next time. Yours, Irene. Irene.